Your skull is leaking. My wife was cradling her coffee cup and leaning against the threshold of the door, staring at me with sleepy eyes. I had been up all night editing a report for my job. The report for my job and other personal details aren't really important. All that I need you to know right now are her words, which she said so casually as if they they had instead been, you've been up all night. I responded as you'd expect. What? With a chuckle and seal. She shrugged, walking off, and a few minutes later, I heard the shower run. I dismissed the comment, attributing it to the post-sleep mental muddiness, the residual incoherent ramblings of a dream. The day progressed, and neither of us brought up the strange comment. The next day I was in our living room connecting a tablet that I had bought that morning to the Wi-Fi, when my wife walked past me and said, Plug up that hole. You'll drown us all. This, of course, was just as weird. And when I looked at her, I felt especially unnerved because she was dressed in a hoodie and sweatpants that she wore while jogging. She hadn't just woken up. I again questioned her, and that time she looked at me with a face full of malice, as if, as if I'd been committing a crime, and inquired as to why I should stop. She then walked away, leaving me puzzled and admittedly hurt. Neither of us spoke of it for the rest of the day, and she behaved as if it hadn't even occurred. The third incident is when things became violent. Our power had gone out in a pretty violent storm, and I had set up candles throughout the house. We owned an abundance of them, owed to my wife's love of fruity scents, but only one flashlight. Now I was on the couch reading a book on the tablet when I saw my wife's silhouette standing in the doorway, which led into the kitchen. She didn't have the candle I'd given her. So I asked if something was wrong. She didn't respond for a while, which unsettled me, though initially because I thought that she had hurt herself in the dark. What made me scared, truly, truly uneasy, was her breathing, which was deep and plainly controlled. She'd been restraining herself, quelling some emotion that would have otherwise been bursting forth. And after a particularly audible exhalation, she spoke. You don't seal up that fucking hole. I'll do it for you. God damn it, Alan. I can't swim through all this shit anymore. I learned from the first two occurrences that responding was pointless. So I just sat there, petrified. Well, she glared at me through the darkness, but this time... This time she didn't walk away. Her breathing didn't relax, and still, in that crazed state of mind, she said, Well? Well, are you gonna do it? Or are you too weak? I jumped to this. Not exactly at the vulgar suggestion, but because because for an instant, some fraction of a second, I heard someone else's voice in concert with my wife's. What is wrong with you? I tried not to sound scared, but failed pathetically. My voice trembled. I was perched in the seat of the couch like a frightened cat. My wife walked towards the coffee table in front of the couch. And before I could comprehend what she was planning, she had leapt over the table, seized me, and forced me onto my back. When I realized what she intended to do, cauterized the, the hole in my head, I struggled against her like a madman, but in her enraged state, she had summoned a strength that impossibly dwarfed my own. She brought the tip of the candle slowly down so as, as to not extinguish the flame and burnt my forehead just above my left eyebrow. And despite the size of the flame, the pain was still unbearable. I begged her to stop, but she just snarled and muttered that I brought it on myself with my procrastination, and she... She acceptedly sealed the hole. She dismounted me and returned the candle to its holder on the table. She walked off into the darkness of the hall and didn't return for the rest of the night. I regained some of my composure and sat on the couch for the rest of the night, numbed, unthinking, traumatized. And the next morning she asked how it felt. I told her I was fine. We ate breakfast, we went on our respective jobs, returned home and ate dinner, and then, and then we watched the show together. It was a normal day. And the next incident I can only partially remember. See, I'd been sleeping beside her on our bed, and something in my subconscious, some primal alert of danger, told me to wake up. And when I did, I found my wife looking at me, her face, her face full of sorrow. When her eyes met, she said, You've got more leaks. 
They've spread all over. I can't close all of those. And then she rolled away from me, placing her head on her pillow. I was about to do the same when she said, I won't let you drown me. And again, I heard that same vocal duality, this time in tone with immense sadness. I got out of the bed, I put on a jacket, I left the house, I drove to a 24-hour grocery store, sat in the parking lot wide awake while the burn in my head throbbed in remembered agony. At this point, you're probably wondering why I didn't just go to the authorities, I didn't report the domestic violence, I mean, especially considering the suggestion of more. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. When dawn arrived, I returned home. And upon seeing me, my wife casually asked, Do you find what you're looking for? I called her a bitch. I got in the shower, locking the door beforehand, of course. I brought my clothes into the bathroom with me, something I didn't usually do just because I didn't, I didn't want to traverse the halls while so plainly vulnerable. She had said that I had leaks all over, and I didn't want to risk so much bodily exposure. Now, I decided to Google the thing that she had said. I found nothing of relevance to me or our lives. I considered that she was just insane, suffering from some randomly emergent psychosis or some other illness of the mind which caused her to see leaks in people. I even considered that I was the one with which something was wrong. Even going so far as to examine myself for tiny holes, I of course found none. I decided that I'd, I'd try to anticipate the exact moment she acted and try to restrain her, then, then interrogate her about what was going on. The results of this interrogation, I reasoned with myself, would influence my decision on whether or not I needed to go to the authorities or, or simply, simply contact a psychiatrist. So I didn't have a chance to stop her when it finally happened. I was in the living room. The open space was a comfort compared to the bedroom, applying some ointment to my wound, and even though the softest touch elicited a pain that made me wince, when my eyes closed for just a second, I felt a warm arm wrap around my neck and my wife's breath in my ear. She pinned me against the wall and, and it fell back onto the couch so that I, I sat forced against her lap. In her other hand with a knife, which she sank into my stomach, and my hands immediately shot to the arm around my neck, but I was powerless to relieve the vice. When the blade entered my flesh, I tried to push her hand away, but I was again met with an insurmountable resistance. See how it spills out of you? You're such a mess. I've been, I've been stepping in puddles all day. But you thought my wife's bizarre behavior was terrifying. I'm, sh I'm sure you can imagine my horror at seeing nothing. Nothing come out of my body. There's a knife slowly, painfully carved up my abdomen. No liquid escaped my wound. Disgusting, isn't it? How it just gushes out. You're lucky I care so much. Anyone else would have been bothered with the bloodletting. It was mockery and self-assuredness in her voice and the other voice, which before had just been barely audible beneath her own, was now just as prominent. See, I don't remember anything else about that day beyond that moment that I, I came to the next day, sitting on a lawn chair in my brother's backyard. He lived 45 minutes away by car, but I hadn't taken my car. I examined myself, my, my, still, my still bloodless wound. I panicked. My, my brother heard me screaming. He took me to an emergency room. I didn't answer his, his battery of questions. I didn't answer the, the staff's questions either. They sewed me up. My brother went and, and brought back my wife. She, she hadn't been answering calls, and she arrived with all this worry and shock you'd expect of her, as if she hadn't been responsible for the wound. And the weirdest thing, the really, the really unsettling part is that at some point I had started bleeding, just gushing the stuff, so neither my brother nor the hospital staff saw what I had seen. It was a normal wound for them. The police were called, of course, not my request, but due to the nature of the wound. It was as, it was at least obvious that I'd been stabbed, that a blade had been inserted and drawn up my gut. The burn mark on my forehead was still plainly visible as well. I didn't even hint at my wife's responsibility. I was, I, was too, I was too freaked out. But this bloodless wound, I wanted to question her privately even more than before. Police had no evidence, which, which suggested it was my wife's fault. They never found any bloodstains. No bloodstained blade, at least when they... When I relented to their requests to search the home. I went from total silence to I don't remember, which was responded with... We could protect you if you tell us what happened. 
and my wife expectantly feigned ignorance. Eventually, the police withdrew their insinuations and questions. I returned the next day with my wife. She looked after me like a saint. She didn't ask how I got the wound. She, she already possessed that knowledge, and it somehow was no emotional distress for her. For a week, she didn't mention any leaks or holes or fractures, fissures, which poured forth something, which actually let loose nothing. And while I didn't forget what had happened, I thought that we had finally moved past it. I had abandoned my desire to ask questions for fear of reigniting the mania and ire. Shortly after that brief return to normal, my wife came running into me, soaking wet, crying that now she was leaking. Initially, I thought it was some morbid joke that she had just decided to mess with me and drench herself by, but something about the way that she was wet, the appearance of the liquid was uncanny, unlike, unlike water in, in some ways like I can't describe. Yet, beyond that, it just looked too wet. I mean, in some lizard brain way, I sensed that the water was inimical. Please help me, she whimpered. She whimpered this over and over. And she buried her head in my chest. I didn't know what to do. And something about the damned wetness repulsed me. I, I gripped her by the shoulders. I looked in her eyes and I asked her everything that I, I wanted to ask for the last month. What did she mean that I was leaking? Why? Why, when she stabbed me, did I not bleed? How was she leaking? Was, was she crazy? Was I? It all came out at the same point. My voice had risen to thunderous shouting. She eventually pulled away from me, still sobbing, and fell onto her butt on the floor. It's all over. They can't patch me up. You certainly can. I'll burst and I'll drown in myself. Her voice was hoarse, her eyes redder than the blood that should have spilled out of my gut a week before, and her whole body shook in, in the disconcerting spasms. I didn't know what to do, how to console her, and part of me didn't even care. It was my wife, sure, but she, she, had, she had also nearly eviscerated me and afterwards acted like she had done me a favor. So I did the only thing I could do. I left. I didn't pack anything. I didn't linger any longer in that house than I had to. I grabbed my phone, keys, wallet, jacket. I drove away to my brother's house. I live with him now. It's been three days. I haven't heard from my wife or the police or my brother. My brother assumes that my stay with him is due to me finally building up the courage to let her go, free myself from her, her abuse. He hasn't the faintest idea of the truth, although I can't say that I have all the facts either. Yesterday, when my brother and I were organizing some stuff in the garage to make, make room for my car, I noticed that his skin seemed distinctively damp. I thought it at first to be sweat, but it was late fall. The garage was, was considerably cooler, and neither of us had exerted ourselves enough to warrant perspiration. But still, still, I could see little beads of liquid on his arms, and there were streaks of something trailing down the side of his face. I didn't mention it to him. He didn't say anything either. And earlier today, I was still making, still making breakfast, and I stepped in a puddle of water. I assumed it had been there from the sink. Perhaps it spilled a bit of water when I, I went to fill up the coffee maker. But something about that puddle, something, something about it just felt wrong. It felt too wet. And as, as I considered this, I thought that my skin felt unusually porous. I hadn't showered yet. But I felt so... So... For lack of a better word, permeable. So I didn't know what it... What it, any of it means, if it means anything at all. But I think that at some point later today, I should go, I should go back home and I should visit my wife. See, my visions have become almost imperceptibly altered. As I'm submerged in eerily clear water and everything, everything sounds dull and delayed. And, sh and strangely distant. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, I... I think I will visit my wife. Hey 
there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we are back after Halloween. So, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreons. Those uh, specifically are the ones that are in the description. And Joey Gilbert, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Chumpinski, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Buddy Burroughs, Stephen Van House, Tristan Pelton, G Weevil 3, Asia, the Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Nico Keo, Caleb Dougal, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, The Ginger Bros, Don Mewmeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Alex, Steampunk Sinner, The Rafael Rodriguez, Optimistic Avocado, and Dr. Strawberry. If you guys would like to join them, you can always head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. Even helping with $1 actually helps keep me alive. So a big thank you to all of you who are there from $1 all the way up to however much that you guys give. Thank you. I appreciate you guys subscribing and checking back with the channel every single day because, dear lord help me, we are on daily uploads, meaning new horror stories from me here at Mr. Creepypasta on YouTube or Mr. Creepypasta on Spotify. Sweet dreams, kids.